So how many things were you able to figure out about a kite? And we'll see how many are on my list. Now, what I have up here is the same kite, A, B, C, D, with congruent sides A, B, and A, D, and then B, C, and C, D. And I've drawn this figure three different times once forming two triangles using diagonal AC, once forming two triangles with diagonal BD, and then the third time drawing in both diagonals to create a lot of smaller triangles. So when I'm looking at this picture, I already know that I have two pairs of congruent sides and I can see that AC is congruent to itself. So the first thing that I see when I look at my kite is the fact that triangle ADC is congruent to triangle ABC by side, side, side. So that's number one. And then the other conclusions that I can come up with from the kite are using CPCTC. Because I know that these two triangles are congruent, I know that angle D and angle B would have to be congruent because they're corresponding parts of the congruent triangles. The other thing that I know is that these angles would also have to be congruent by CPCTC. And because angle DAC and CAB are congruent to each other, I could say that angle DAB, which is the angle of the kite, is being um, bisected, cut exactly into two congruent pieces. And the same thing's happening down here. Angle DCB of the kite is being bisected into a pair of congruent angles. So I see that a pair of opposite angles are being bisected. Now the thing that you have to be careful of with kites is that angle DAB and angle DCB not necessarily congruent to each other. So we have one pair of opposite angles that are bisected and one pair of opposite angles that are congruent to each other. And once I'm through all the properties, I will show you an easy way that you can remember which is which. Looking um, at our second diagram, I don't know that I have a lot of other congruent pieces. Um, I can say that because I have congruent segments um, in a single triangle, the angles opposite are congruent. And I can say the same thing for my second triangle, but knowing that these angles are congruent to each other doesn't mean they're gonna be the same measure as these angles because they're two completely separate triangles. I do know that segment BD is congruent to itself, but that's not going to give me any congruent triangles, which means no CPCTC, no additional parts. So the best thing that I can say looking at this picture is the fact that I see two isosceles triangles. And then finally, when I put the two diagonals together, I'm going to be able to come up with a few more pieces of information about my kite. Now, my starting point does involve that first picture because I already know that the two triangles that are formed by diagonal AC have to be congruent to each other. And if they're congruent to each other, I know that by CPCTC, I get a pair of congruent angles here. I also know that in my isosceles triangle, the angles opposite would be congruent to each other. And that means that I can say, just name this point E, I can say that triangle ADE is congruent to triangle ABE by angle side angle. And if those two triangles are congruent to each other, I know that also by CPCTC, these two angles would be congruent to each other. And because they're congruent and they're a linear pair, that means that they each have to have measures of 90 degrees. And if I have right angles, that means that the diagonals of my kite are perpendicular to each other. And the other thing that I know by CPCTC is that this side of um, triangle ADE has to be congruent to this side of triangle ABE. And if these two segments are congruent, that means that diagonal BD is being bisected. But even though diagonal DB is being bisected, doesn't tell me that diagonal AC is. Only one diagonal of a kite is bisected. Now, this is a pretty complete list of everything that we can say about a kite. Your book doesn't see every individual one of these as a theorem. So what your book says is we need to know what the definition is. 
So exactly two pairs of congruent consecutive sides. And then we have one diagonal that gives us a pair of congruent angles, one diagonal that gives us a pair of isosceles triangles that aren't congruent, but they are isosceles. Diagonals are perpendicular and one diagonal is bisected. Now to me, the easiest way to remember all of these properties, especially since it says one diagonal is bisected, one pair of opposite angles is congruent, is if you imagine that you have the kite in your hand and you picture how things match up when you fold them. So I can see, and actually I'll hold it this way so it doesn't look exactly the same as that one. So I can see that when I fold it across this diagonal, these two triangles match up exactly. And if these two triangles match up exactly, that means that this angle and this angle also match up exactly. They're the congruent angles. When I fold them and I see that these two angles match up exactly, that means that this angle of the kite is one of the angles that's being bisected. I can see that because the distance from this vertex to the fold of the diagonal would be the same, this is the diagonal that's being split into congruent pieces. When I try to fold it this way, as soon as I get this far, I can see that those two triangles aren't gonna be exactly the same. And if they're not the same, these two angles are not going to be the same as each other. That diagonal is not the diagonal that's going to be bisected. So there are easy ways that you can remember it. Now, when we put all of our quadrilaterals together, it makes pretty much a quadrilateral family tree. And there's three different main branches of quadrilaterals. So we start with our general quadrilateral. From there, we have our parallelogram family. The parallelogram family splits into rectangles and rhombi. And then when we bring the rectangle and rhombus together, all of those shared characteristics are um, a square. Our second family is the trapezoid family. And the trapezoid family only has one additional member, and that would be the isosceles trapezoid. And then off in a family all by itself is the kite family. And if you kind of learn to separate them into these groups, that's going to be helpful when it comes time to remember the properties. And just like with the kite, I said that you can picture folding it and how things match up. You can do that with the other figures as well. Um, with a parallelogram, I know that if I take it and I fold it on either one of its diagonals, I'm going to create triangles that are congruent. Now, not by just folding them um, directly in half, I do have to take those two triangles and take one of them and kind of flip it around, but I can see that that's going to make them match up. When I'm looking at a rectangle, in a rectangle, I can take the two bottom triangles and kind of slide these out and I'm creating right triangles that are congruent. And that's why in my rectangle, the diagonals are congruent. But in a parallelogram, if I take those two bottom um, triangles and I pull them out, those two triangles, not congruent, no congruent diagonals. And when I have a rhombus, in a rhombus, just like in a kite, I can picture everything being folded. When I fold along the long diagonal, congruent triangles, everything matches up. But in a rhombus, if I fold it this way, everything matches up as well. So that's an easy way to remember that we're going to have all of our opposite angles bisected and congruent as opposed to just one in the kite. And even in an isosceles trapezoid, we do have a line of reflection that we can fold it across. It's just not one of the diagonals. But if I fold it in half this way, I can see which angles are going to be congruent, um, which ones would be our pairs of base angles.